Good afternoon, my lucky fellow residents of Malaysia. I'm Wu Wing Tai, the president of the Jeffrey Chia Institute of Southeast Asia at Sunway University. Welcome to the talk by Tato Siri Utama Haji Mukris Tun Mahathir. Dr. Siri Mukris will share with us today his strategy to accelerate economic development in Kedah and how to ensure that the fruits of progress will reach every resident in Kedah. Before I call upon Dr. Siri Mukris to speak, I would like to invite Dan Sri Rasman Muhammad Hashim, trustee of the Jeffrey Chia Foundation and board member of ASLI, the co-sponsor of this event, to deliver the opening remarks. Dan Sri, Mr. Thank you, uh, Professor Wu. I thought it was not necessary. We all want to hear what uh, YAB has to say rather than what, what I have to say. But anyway, uh, Tantri Jeffrey Chia, founder and chairman of the Sunway Group, board members of the Tantri Jeffrey Chia Institute and board members of AFSLI, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Sunway University. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And in particular, I wish to express my gratitude to YAB, Datuk Sri Mukris for you taking time to, from his busy schedule to be with us today. This dialogue with the theme Dynamic Economic Development and Shared Prosperity, the Kedah Way, is especially relevant in these challenging times facing our nation. My congratulations to the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia, especially Professor Wu and Asli for jointly organizing this event. The Jeffrey Chia Institute has become known for conducting various events that contribute to a shared discourse regarding issues and developments in Malaysia and the region. ASLI, or the, ASLI, or the Asian Strategy and Leadership Institute, is Malaysia's, leading, is Malaysia's leading independent, private, and not for profit think tank, whose mission is to create a better society. A major component of this mission is to serve as a credible and trusted link between key stakeholders to develop strategy options and key recommendations. And ladies and gentlemen, like all of you, I look forward to a frank and forthright discussion on matters of great importance. I am particularly eager to hear from YAB Dato Sri Mukris of his plans to help Kedah prosper and progress. Kedah, after all, is the oldest state in Malaysia and was a commercial center for traders from various countries, especially China and India. And if I'm not mistaken, is still continue to be the main rice producer for the country. In this context, it would be also very refreshing to hear YAB's perspectives and insights on the shared prosperity vision 2030 launched by the federal government recently. In closing, I would like once again to thank YAB for sharing this valuable time with us today. Thank you very much, YAB, and thank you. Thank you, Tan Sri Rasman. So, Tato Siri, it's your show. Assalamualaikum oh. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon. I am Bagia Tansi Jeffrey Cha and uh, the board members of the uh, Jeffrey Cha Foundation and board members of ASLI, uh, Bagia Tansi Rasman, uh, Prof Wu, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me um, to give a short uh, talk and address some of the questions you may have uh, of interest uh, in Kedah. And uh, I'm very happy to be given this opportunity to 
explain a little bit about what is it that we plan to do, where we are at the moment, what kind of challenges we've been facing with all this while, and uh, how do we address them, and how do we push forward uh, Kedah so that it is no longer known as the second uh, poorest state in the country. <laughs> second poorest state. It's not something that we brag, but it's a, it's a fact. Um, as you may all know, uh, and Prof Wu just uh, alluded to that just now, I think uh, Tan Sri Azman mentioned, that um, Kedah is the oldest state in the country. How is it the oldest? Uh, in many ways, uh, one of which is very interestingly, um, the Kedah constitution or the state constitution is the oldest constitution in the country. Uh, the area of Changlun, you might have heard of this place called Changlun in Bukit Kehitam, uh, was an area that first had its uh, Malaysia's or the, the Malaya's first uh, land office. Uh, the first land office in this whole country was in Changlun. And, uh, and from there, it, uh, it became the norm in Kedah. In fact, when the British came, uh, they decided that Kedah didn't need a resident uh, advisor because uh, uh, our civil service was already in place. But um, we've been very much an agricultural state for so long, uh, as was mentioned just now. Tansi uh, Rasman also said that uh, we produce a lot, a lot of rice. <laughs> we used to um, uh, produce about 70% of all the rice that all of you consume in this country. Uh, now that's down to about 35. Uh, and this is due to uh, population growth, of course, uh, and of course, more of our paddy land being developed for housing and, and such. And, uh, and due to that, we are now a net importer of rice when we should be uh, producing enough for our own consumption. We, we contribute much towards, the, uh, towards food security, which, in, which is an extremely important aspect of economy. Uh, but, um, but nowadays, I think this is a very hot topic these days. Uh, we are now importing a lot of food uh, to feed our own people, which is something that we ought to be looking at more seriously. At the same time, the production of rice, unfortunately, doesn't enrich our people. It's an industry that is heavily dependent on subsidies from the federal government, particularly. Um, and <clears throat> this is the way I see it not so sustainable. We, we ought to be looking at how we can increase our yield uh, at the right price, at the same time, make sure that our paddy farmers can act a living uh, much like at other uh, industries, you know. Um, so for so long, Kedah has been kept uh, somewhat poor because of this commitment we have towards food security. And to make things worse, uh, in order for us to produce rice, we need a lot of water. This is somehow the way we do it in, in Malaysia, in, in Kedah particularly, for so long. The way we produce rice, we literally inundate the paddy fields with water. If you look uh, up north in Thailand, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, they don't do it that way. They don't need so much water to produce uh, rice, but in Malaysia we do. And in order to supply water, we have to have enough uh, water catchment areas, which means uh, forest, uh, lakes, dams, rivers, and all that, you know. So Kedah, is perfect for rice because it's relatively flat with a lot of water so and enough sunshine. So this combination of three makes it the right place for ri uh, rice cultivation. But because of that also, uh, we, we, uh, we, maybe it's a good thing, we can't uh, exploit our forests as much as some people would like. I mean, we are not inclined towards that. but. Uh, for Kedah, uh, what other states would, seem, uh, to, would deem as a good source of revenue, which is the forest, mainly logging and things like that. In the case of Kedah, because of water catchment and all that, we prefer uh, to keep our forest pristine. I think most of you would probably agree with uh, our policy on this. And, um, but again, uh, as I said, uh, we have a forest that's just sitting there. Uh, perhaps there are many other ways to exploit 
uh, the forest not by by cutting down trees but by developing tourism for example um, we have enough uh, supply of water uh, which well Prof Wu would know this we we supply also to two other states not just Kedah Penang and Perlis actually uh, for free <laughs> so so that's one one thing that we've uh, we've always been uh, working on to see how best we can be compensated for that but that's okay that's a different st story altogether and um, but but we need some other sources of revenue yeah uh, for Kedah to push itself up uh, to be more comparative as uh, comparatively to other more developed uh, states. By 1996, we started embarking more seriously in industrialization. That was the year uh, Kulem High Tech Park was first uh, built, uh, developed. And since that year until now, over 31 billion ringgit has been invested in Kulem High Tech Park alone. Uh, creating 26,000 jobs. The average pay is 5,800 ringgit. Yeah. Uh, and 95% Malaysians working there. These are high value, uh, high value jobs. Uh, and um, I'm happy to say 80% Kedahans, uh, who, who instead of working in paddy fields or migrating to other states, uh, the one, the closest one, of course, would be Penang. And some go to Selangor. Some, of course, are in Johor. But many Mal uh, Malaysians and Kedahans, particularly, uh, also are sent as teachers to Sabah, Sarawak, also overseas. Yeah. So, when we started Kulim High Tech Park, at first, no one thought that an agrarian uh, ag ag state like Kedah can handle uh, high tech industries. But we have proven it uh, uh, otherwise. That we are capable of doing it, and we've done it in such a successful way. And uh, uh, for your information, um, we are looking at expanding Kulim Hatak Park to double the, the size it is right now, uh, and also duplicating that success in other areas, Bukit Kayu Hitam, we have a special border economic zone. I'm going to touch on some of these things a bit later. We have Rubber City in Padang Terap. Uh, we plan to have our brand new uh, international airport uh, in Sungai but uh, we call it Kulim, but uh, it's actually in Sungai Ptani. I'll explain why later. And, uh, and, and, and other, uh, uh, of course, NCIA, uh, Northern Corridor, uh, will be developing a new industrial park for the aerospace and logistics manufacturing uh, in Sidam. You know. So um, why we, uh, are we doing this? Because we have proven that even though Kedah is more closely related to rice, after all, we are known as the rice bowl of the country, uh, we have proven to the rest of the world that when it comes to running industrial parks, we do it uh, in an excellent uh, manner. In fact, when I was in Miti, um, everywhere we go, when we do our investment promotions, we always use Kulim Hatak Park as the base, as the example of uh, how uh, uh, an industrial park ought to be run. So we're quite happy with that. So we have several challenges. Um, uh, income levels in the state is uh, second lowest in the country. Um, GDP is not quite growing the, the pace that we want it to. Um, there was again mentioned about the wawasan kemakmuran bersama, the shared prosperity uh, vision which was launched by the federal government uh, recently. And I was very happy to hear that Kedah was mentioned as one of the states that needs to be given extra attention. And I think this is extremely important. Why? Because, because we believe that if the nation wants to grow at a certain pace, say anything above 5% uh, per year, it's the poorer ones that need to be growing even faster than that. Yeah. If not, we would be a drag we would be the parachute behind the fighter jet, you know. So a uh, jet lands, it's the parachute that's, that helps to stop it. We don't want to be that for uh, the economic growth of the nation. We, we need to be the one that is pushing the country forward. And we're not asking for much. We don't need a KLCC. We, we, don't, we want a new airport. We don't, want a KL, we don't need a KLIA-sized airport. Uh, but something that acts as a catalyst so that 
we don't be, uh, continue to become a drag uh, for the rest of the country. Uh, instead, we, 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 we are starting from a lower base. I would think it's easier actually for us to grow. Uh, and when we do that, I think the whole nation benefits from that. So ladies and gentlemen, how do we do this? Uh, first of all, uh, the state of Kedah, um, under my leadership, we are very committed towards the environment. I'm happy to say that, first of all, you might have heard, we've decided that uh, we stop all forms of logging in the area of Ulumuda. Yeah. Um, and Ulumuda is the most pristine forest we have the, uh, in Kedah. Uh, it's, uh, it's really wonderful. It's uh, a real uh, thick um, uh, primary rainforest. We have elephants there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and although I've not seen them myself, but, uh, but everyone else who's been there uh, have seen them. It's just my luck. When I go, they don't come out. <laughs> but <laughs> there must be something wrong. Uh, I, I don't know. I have to go back there again. So I'd like to invite all of you to come and see, see it for yourselves. And, and uh, we think that there must be some way to exploit the forest without destroying it. I mean, this is, uh, I guess, a perennial uh, issue. Uh, I have spoken to UNDP. I went to New York to talk to talk to them about about um, uh, one of the programs that they they have for how to develop the forest without without destroying it, and all kinds of schemes, including financial packages that can be provided by certain uh, financial institutions to help uh, countries or states like Ada. Uh, develop or exploit the forest without without destruction. Uh, so um, uh, it's usually from tourism, and we see good example in the uh, Danum Valley in Sabah. Um, and I, I think there there are some uh, things that we could learn from them, and we want to do something similar like that in Kedah. Um, Kedah also, as you know, uh, has an, a lot of sunlight. So because of the high irradiance, uh, we are just perfect for solar farms. Um, Kedah at the moment generates over 200 megawatts uh, of uh, energy from solar. I think we are the highest in the country right now. Uh, the recent uh, LL, uh, LSS4, I think, uh, three, sorry, three, that, um, that was uh, put out by the uh, Mastec. Uh, many of the proposals uh, came from companies w that want to do something in Kedah. Uh, so um, we still have a lot of land, um, and we think that uh, the more of them, the better, because that shows of, uh, our commitment, uh, how do we reduce uh, carbon emissions. So I think there is no question about Kedah not contributing towards the green e uh, economy. Um, secondly, of course, is growth factors. So we are looking into uh, catalytic projects that can help bring Kedah to a different level. Uh, I mentioned just now that um, Kulem High Tech Park is going to be expanded. One small issue we have is that uh, the district, uh, the, the um, local council that handles Kulim High Tech Park is a special one that was created by an enactment in Parliament. Uh, it's, uh, it actually belongs to a state GLC. Uh, the, the State Economic Development Corporation owns the, P the PBT, uh, owns the local government in Kulim High Tech Park. But the land area that they have is now uh, basically uh, exhausted. And now they are moving into the uh, uh, local government of Kulim, which is right next door. So some of the new investors that are coming in in phase four of Kulim High Tech Park are complaining that their address doesn't actually say Kulim High Tech Park, it says Sungai Sluang. <laughs> you know, so, so they're not too happy about that name. It doesn't sound glamorous enough, you know. I mean, uh, they want to show to people, oh, this is a high-tech factory, and then it cannot be a Sungai Sluang there, you know. It, it needs to say Kulem High-Tech Park, you know. So, so because of that, uh, we are working on actually merging the two uh, local governments. Uh, so the district of uh, uh, Kulem will include Kulem High-Tech Park, and the reason for that is so that Kulem High-Tech Park will have access to a larger tract of land, 
for them to develop as uh, extension to phase five, six, and the rest. And then we want to duplicate that success in Bukit Kayu Hitam. Uh, Bukit Kayu Hitam now, a border town with uh, Thailand, um, is going to be a, a new growth area. Yeah, it's, um, there are certain inherent advantages of having a, a, develop, a, a industrial park adjacent to a neighboring country. Um, a lot of trade from Indochina, um, most particularly from Thailand, of course, comes through Bukit Kaitam and goes straight to Penang. You see, so you can imagine areas like Songkla, for example, which is in the east coast of Thailand, uh, receiving goods uh, at their port, um, being freighted by road, going through Bukit Kaitam, ending up at the Penang port so that they can access, uh, they can go continue or proceed to the Middle East and, uh, and, uh, and that part, that part of the world. So Bukit Kaitam is actually extremely uh, strategic. Yeah. So uh, the Special Border Economic Zone, uh, there is a new development there called the Northern Gateway. This is under the MOF Incorporated. Uh, they are building a new lo logistics hub um, and moving towards an inland port. And uh, the key game changer there will be a single clearance of customs, um, really. And right now, uh, for whatever reason, I guess for bureaucratic reasons, perhaps, um, uh, when a container comes in from Thailand uh, into Bukit Kaitam, it's actually checked three times. Yeah. Once on the Thai side, it crosses the border again, we check it uh, on our side. It goes to Penang, it gets checked again before it goes on, the, on board a ship. Yeah. So the game changer is to do it just once. And this is not something that's uh, un, uh, not been done before. Uh, it's been done many other places. So we think that the single clearance project will be uh, something that will boost trade between New China and Malaysia and of course the rest of the world. So imagine what we are negotiating right now actually with the Thais is for the Thai customs to sit on our side the container comes in, both uh, customs officers from Malaysia and Thailand will be inspecting the goods from the container, and then it will be um, uh, in installed uh, with a, uh, a temper-proof device that uh, basically uh, locks the container. It goes straight to Penang port onto the, onto the ship, uh, and that's handled by the shipping company. So it does, it, it's only one, one check, and that's it. And we think that that's going to be uh, one factor that will boost uh, trade between into, into China and, and uh, other parts of the world, including uh, for Malaysia. So uh, uh, next to, to Northern Gateway will be another industrial park um, that's going to be developed by two parties. One is a group from China, and another group which is uh, uh, the state SCDC. Yeah. So both of them have got large tracts of land for this purpose, and we're looking into halal food if, um, industries uh, uh, in, uh, of course, logistics again, and, uh, and any other uh, industries that find it suitable to be located there. Uh, on, the, on the right side of that uh, is an area called Padang Terap. Uh, we, uh, well in, in the middle of uh, land clearing for what we call the Kedah Rubber City. Yeah? It's not a city made with buildings made of rubber, <laughs> but, uh, but it's an industrial park that we want to locate uh, industries related to rubber. As you know, we, we are main producer or one of the largest producers of rubber. Um, however, we, we are trying to convince our uh, our rubber estates to move more towards uh, latex production rather than scrub. Yeah? Uh, and then uh, it, it's the usual uh, usual uh, suspects like uh, uh, rubber gloves, um, uh, medical uh, rubber appliances, things like that, catheters and stuff. But also we're looking into more high-tech um, rubber industries. Yeah. As you know, um, um, I think this Rubber Research Institute owns uh, TAC, yeah, the Tun Abdul Razak Rubber Research Center, just outside of London. 
uh, a lot of fantastic work they do there, and I, I was hoping that uh, some of those patents that they use can be used to produce uh, products uh, at our rubber city. So uh, that's one area that, that's being worked on by uh, NCIA. And then um, um, uh, our pet project, which is the uh, KXP, we call it. That's the code, uh, the call sign. Uh, every airport has a call sign. Uh, and this new airport uh, for the moment is called uh, Kulim uh, International Airport. So the call sign is KXP, that's what we call it. And uh, actually, it's not really quite located in Kulim. It's in an area called Sidam, which is located in Sungai But we figured that uh, uh, Sungai Petani International Airport is a bit of a mouthful. So, so and, and everyone knows Kulim. Uh, and in fact, the, most, the, the people most excited about this, this airport development are tenants of the Kulim uh, Kulim uh, High Tech Park, because then it, they, will, they will have an international airport just 20 minutes away from where they, were, they are. Uh, so they are the most excited about it. Uh, so that's why for now, uh, we still call it uh, Kulim International Airport. Why are we doing this? It's really a, a cargo airport. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not um, downplaying the good work that, that Penang is doing. But uh, Penang Airport is growing, uh, and the demand for the airport is ever growing all the time. Yeah? Um, but we feel that Penang is still focused on passengers. And uh, they, of course, another part of the business of, of uh, airports is cargo. And we found that uh, quite a number of industries, not only in Kedah, but also in Penang, are uh, literally freighting their goods by road to KLIA. Uh, why? Because um, because of uh, congestion at the Penang Airport. So I was explaining this to Prof Wu, who was a very strong advocate of Penang Airport at one time. But uh, I think he understands now, right? So, so we, we are now, so we, we are now really uh, having a need. Because I, I find that when I talk to potential in investors to come to Kedah, one of the things they ask me is, uh, uh, where's the nearest cargo airport? And I can't say KLIA. That's, too far, yeah, so so when we talk about the the potential of having our own uh, cargo airport, an international one at that, uh, they get really excited about that. And right next to the airport is uh, at the moment we call it SLAM. Yeah? Uh, why? Because it's in Sidam Logistics and uh, Aerospace Manufacturing. Yeah, so um, uh, at one time I was thinking that we have. Sidam Logistics Aerospace Manufacturing, Dewan Undangan Negeri Kedah, so slam dunk, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I said things is not, it's not funny. So, <laughs> so, okay. so we'll stick with slam for the moment. <laughs> it's not quite a slam dunk yet. Um, so we think that uh, it is important for uh, industries um, that are specific in certain areas like aerospace be immediate, uh, immediately located adjacent to uh, an airport. I, when I was in METI, uh, we knew that several industries were basically vying for spots uh, next to Subang Airport. Like we know, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Spirit Aerosystems, yeah, which is located at Subang. Um, they have access to the airport. Uh, then, of course, AirRod was doing MRO, several other. Uh, you have Sapura uh, um, and all that, all located there, basically uh, making full use of their access to a runway. And uh, so MRO is, I won't say the easiest part, but that, that is a low-hanging fruit. Uh, if you have a, a, um, MRO at an airport, it's easy for aircraft to come and do all their maintenance, repair, and overhaul work there. But then I'm more interested in industries. Why do we want to do this in Kedah? Because that northern region of Kedah and Penang particularly, we are the major uh, area for electronic and electrical goods. We also have precision metal parts uh, production. We have, of course, plastic uh, material, plastics, 
uh, even precision plastics there. We have automotive industries there. All of these basically add to the advantage or the attractiveness of uh, this northern region, particularly uh, Kedah and Penang, for industries like that, aerospace particularly. Uh, in Bukit Kayu Hitam, there is already a, a company called ACM, which belongs to Boeing. It's been there for almost 20 years, ladies, gen ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people don't know this. But they, they, they do composite material for, air, uh, for aircraft wings, or Boeing aircraft uh, wings. Yeah? Um, so Malaysia, of course, is known for its composite material for aerospace. Uh, one, of the, one of the plants uh, is in Kedah, in Bukit Keritan. Uh, and, and we feel that if we can bring more of that sort of stuff, and we also have in, uh, in Penang and Kedah, companies doing avionics. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, catalyst is there already. We just need to have a, a new area uh, built purposely for uh, aerospace. And we think we'll be able to attract more investments uh, in this area. I, I've spoken to a number of uh, aircraft manufacturers uh, across uh, uh, from Russia, from Europe, uh, Ukraine, and, uh, and they're also interested. When I asked them, why do you think Kedah should do this? They said, because ASEAN is the new booming market for aircraft, so they need to be where uh, their customers are. Um, when you have so many budget airlines, the, the uh, procurement of aircraft is uh, happening mostly in the Middle East and also ASEAN. So if they can have some uh, manufacturing here, uh, or even assembly, uh, they'd be happy to have access to this kind of uh, industrial park. So that, this is why we, we're doing it. And so far, I'm happy to report that uh, we are almost signing with several of these companies uh, who will become our anchor tenants uh, for, uh, for SLAM. So we hope to achieve a SLAM duck soon. <laughs> so, uh, so, Mr. Chairman, in a nutshell, that's where we are at, at the moment. And, and I believe that my um, stint in Kedah, I, I have to focus on bringing Kedah up uh, the uh, value chain uh, so that we are no longer a drag for, for the rest of the country. Uh, we want to contribute. We want to be good taxpayers. We want to be contributing to the coffers of the federal government. At, at the same time, of course, I'm always begging for help from the federal government, and and I'm I, I'm happy to report that they have been very supportive. Uh, I think the federal government is uh, very helpful. I, I don't know, maybe because of the uh, one of our member of parliament is the prime minister, <laughs> 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 that helps too. So uh, when he's when he's focused on Langkawi, we we get some uh, spin uh, spillover from that also. But, uh, but literally all the ministries, you know, uh, every time we ask for something, they, are, they, they really uh, try to go out of their way, way to, to help uh, states, poorer states like Kedah. Yeah, I think that's what the vision is all about, uh, about helping those states that are a bit behind, uh, giving them a little bit of attention that they need, of course, with uh, certain budgets. And then I think uh, we have no other way but up. After that, so I'm I'm open to questions. But again, I'd like to thank you for filling up this day one just to listen to my uh, short uh, spiel. Thank you very much. Well, let's have the question session. We'll take three questions at a time, so that uh, Dato Siri can choose the questions that. To, that will make him look good. <laughs> so, the lady in the front, the gentleman in the at, in in the set, and the lady over there. So yes, it's very heartening to know that you know you're keeping your forests and you are actually going for ecotourism. How can we encourage your fellow Mantri Bursas in the other states? to do the same, please, because there's so much illegal logging going on. And when we talk to the ministries, they say it's a state matter. So then we have to really go back to the, the state owners. Thank you. Um, Dato Sri, you mentioned uh, the role of the federal government and the support it's given so far. What else uh, can be done by the federal government to support you know, poorer states like Kedah? 
Um, and do you think there should be a change in the current institutional relationship, for instance, between federal and state governments uh, like Kedah? Okay, thank you, YAB, for your very insightful talk. And we are glad to see that there's some uh, effort in uh, development in Kedah. But I had the uh, opportunity to visit Kedah a few times last year, and I was very pleased to find that Kedah was such a gem. I went to Lembabujang, Lembabujang Sungai Batu archaeological site, it's amazing, but the toilets are not working, the blood, there's rubbish everywhere, and there's no real proper documentation of what's going on. I would like to suggest the Centre for Research Creation in Digital Media from Sunway University to help out somewhere. <laughs> a second issue is Ulu Muda. My family and I went to Ulu Muda after you visited. We were so impressed that you actually visited Earth Lodge. We managed to see the elephants. Oh. It is such, yes! And we heard hornbills, we heard gibbons in the morning. It is a very, very precious place. And we were wondering if you have any plans to uh, gazette it as a state park. Thirdly, and very importantly, I would like to bring up the issue of uh, Sungai Petani. There's a lot of plastic waste recycling uh, factories there. Uh, it was a huge issue in 2018 in Jinja Room in Port Klang. There's news reports of all the syndicates moving from Klang to Penang Port and then uh, setting up base in Sungai Petani. My friends who have um, organic farms there and friends um, starting families there and every night they smell the fumes. And in Jinjarum, Greenpeace did a report, fisheries department, they found toxic materials in the prawn farms and prawns all died because of the plastic factories. I'm just wondering what is the impact of these plastic factories on our rice bowl? and what you plan to do about it. Thank you. First, um, I, I, the first question was about how do we convince the other MBs? Well, you know, I, I re actually have to say I empathize with them because uh, as correctly pointed out, uh, land is a state matter. The federal government has only a certain say. But then the forest department is under cats. Yeah. Um, now, uh, for those states that have other sources of revenue, like oil, gas, and industries, I think they, they won't be too troubled by uh, preserving the forest. It, it is the poorer states that have limited sources of revenue uh, that are pressured. They're, they are under extreme pressure. And, and if you're not creative enough to think of new ways to generate income for the state, then the easiest way out is just by logging. Uh, when we decided to stop logging in only Ulumuda alone, that's 60 million ringgit lost in, in a year. Just like that. And I have to find ways not only to, to recover that by other means, but we are already now exposed to potential uh, claims by concessionaires because uh, many of them have actually paid premiums during the previous government. Uh, so uh, they are now demanding, uh, what do we do about their concessions? Do we, do we move them elsewhere, get them to do something else? Uh, uh, or do we compensate them not only in full, plus plus? Yeah. Because uh, loss of opportunity and such. My dream. The most ideal situation is if I can convert a, a logger to an eco-tourist developer. <laughs> if I can do that, I think uh, there should be a, a, a paper in Harvard about it or something. You know? <laughs> a case study in Harvard or something like that where, where we can convince people to do that. But I don't think it's impossible. Um, so so we, we have to work on that. But for the states, I think we need to keep talking to them about uh, and helping them, federal government particularly, I think need to help the poorer states find new sources of revenue. It's, it's not uh, on to just tell them, uh, stop the logging. In our case, uh, also, uh, you have to stop logging because you are producing rice, you need water. Uh, we know that. Uh, but we, we need help. We, we're not making demands from the federal government, but then we need as much help as we, we can get. And uh, as I reported just now, the federal government is very helpful there. So uh, in, in a way, I'm not really answering the question, but that's as diplomatic as I can get, I guess. <laughs> um, 
Okay. What, how is the federal government helping uh, states and, and uh, how can we improve? You know what? I, I came from the previous uh, government before uh, um, and then uh, we came back in under a new government. I think this is a golden opportunity to relook at how the relations between state government and federal government is and then to see where we can improve them. Do you believe that some of the laws that, that we are bound by were made uh, right after independence and they've not been changed? You know, some are so archaic that it just don't make sense anymore. Um, uh, uh, some of the the financial relationship we have with federal government. Federal government has certain certain ways that they they contribute um, uh, budgets to the state governments. Uh, we find that some of them are not so relevant. Yeah. So maybe we can change that a little bit to make it more in tune with the times. Yeah. Uh, uh, I could give you some examples like. For example, the federal government will give you money, state will get money for uh, maintenance of, uh, of roads. Yeah. So some of the conditions of the road for it to qualify to receive these uh, maintenance funds, uh, I, I think needs to be changed. And we have already brought this up with the federal government. I think they're really looking into that, to that already. So, there, there is a new opportunity because we are a new government, both state and federal, coming from the same uh, ruling party. So we can, we, we, I, I think we have the political will to make these uh, changes. And then, um, the <clears throat> how do we do a state park but still call it a national park? That's that's my challenge, because when we promote a, a state park, it doesn't have the the attraction when the, yeah you know you need a catchy name when you call some place a national park people want to go to that you know Yellowstone National Park oh, okay you know uh, Yosemite or something like that and um, so Joho has done it the the Joho national parks are actually state parks but they call them national parks so we are looking into amending our uh, our state park law uh, to take in learnings from Johor and I, I think Pahang has, has done it so so that we we can uh, uh, term some of our forests as uh, national parks when they are actually in fact state parks. There, there is a slight difference. Um, we'd rather keep them as state parks because that means the state has control over them. Uh, when when it becomes a, a real national park, that means federal, it's federal government. and. Uh, state governments are very possessive about our land. That's the only thing we have. So we, we are always reluctant to relinquish uh, control over land matters. So um, the way Danum Valley does it, they uh, alienate a certain area forest uh, as, uh, as the national state park. Uh, I think it's under Yaisan Sabah. And then right outside the park, they build resorts. So uh, it's in those areas you're allowed to do that. So then tourists can go to the resorts and then do da daily excursions into the, f into the forest. I think that's the model that we'd like to uh, consider. Uh, but we are open to any, or well, maybe Tansi Jeffrey would like to invest in Kedah. This is, uh, <laughs> or you have many uh, tycoon friends who will be willing. Uh, so we'll be very happy to, to uh, uh, look into potential areas where they can develop resorts and things like that. Uh, we've been talking to Kazana also. I don't know, I hope it's not, uh, not confidential, but uh, they, they own Datai and, and they've done fantastic work in Datai in Langkawi. So we want, we, we're hoping they would be interested to do something just outside of Ulumuda. Uh, Lembah Bujang, of course, uh, I've not spoken about it, but each time I have the opportunity, uh, I heavily promote it because it, it is uh, the Bujang Valley yeah, is what it's called. Uh, it's already uh, documented that the civilization began uh, sometime around 800 BC. Yeah, yeah, 800 BC. Yeah. So 
uh, it was a trading post. Well, uh, uh, um, it was already a civilization at the time. And there are four things that they did, which, was, I, I, which I think is very significant. One is uh, they had mining already. They had the mining industry. They were mining iron ore. And uh, the iron that they mined in and around Kedah was of the highest grade. Yeah. Um, so much so that Kedah was known, I'm told, that by some, uh, some of our professors, uh, particularly from USM, that uh, the name of Kedah actually means uh, hard iron. And if you look at it, uh, well, I, I'm not so sure about other languages, but uh, Kedah is also known as Kataram, uh, Kataha. Uh, and, and then uh, in, in uh, the historical uh, books in Japan, uh, Kedah was known as Kata. And Kata in Japanese uh, also means hard. Yeah? Um, and uh, you might know the Japanese salt is called a katana. Uh, so, uh, so the the, high, the the hardest iron came from uh, Kedah. So, um, and what was interesting is that uh, large deposits of iron ore come from meteorite. So you can actually do almost like a DNA uh, on swords and things like that to determine where this iron came from. And apparently, we, we've got some students posted in, in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, and things like just to test the blades of some of these uh, swords to see whether it actually came from Kedah. That's an, an interesting thing to look at. But um, so mining. And then there is uh, industry. Uh, when they mine the iron ore, they need to smelt it. So they had the technology to smelt iron at 1,000 degrees Celsius. You know, I, I think it's quite incredible that you know, uh, almost 2,000 years ago they, they did this. And, um, and uh, how do we prove that? Uh, you will find millions of pieces of what you call uh, tuya. Tuya, I guess it's a French word. It's T-U-Y-E-R-E. -E. You can Google it. It's, uh, it's like a clay uh, 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 pipe. You know that they used to blow air into the furnace to bring the temperature up to a thousand degrees. Uh, so, so they were they had industries, and then what did they have? They had trade, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, uh, they they were trading iron ore for uh, silk, for spices, with India, with China. This was so long ago. So I was thinking they should have a matrate there and then at the time. <laughs> you know. So, uh, and then when you do trade. You, have, you must have someone who, who basically arbitrates between the value of the import, imported goods and the export goods. So you have, uh, in, in Malay, it's called Shah Bandar, uh, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, sorry, the, the, um, the, the people who actually uh, uh, manage the trade. Yeah? So when these big ships came in, uh, so they look at the value of the spices or the silk that they bring in, and then they compare it with the value of the iron ore that we're trying to export. So to, to make it a fair trade, yeah? uh, but it was all butter. So, so there were big ships coming all the way up to Lumabujang. I'm taking a bit too long on this, on this subject, but then just to give you an idea that um, uh, when you look at this place right now, it's just a small stream. So people wonder, how can you have big ships there? Well, in those days, 2,000 years ago, the sea came all the way to the foot of Mount Jirai, Gunung Jirai. Uh, right at the foot of Gunung Jirai was already the sea. So since then, the, the uh, water has receded. Uh, to create Sungai Petani, Merbo, and all, all that area uh, was, is new, actually. So that big river now is just a small stream. But because of that, the uh, professor, Dato' Mohta Saidin, who actually runs the archaeological work there, uh, tells me that they've already found uh, shipwrecks at the bottom of that riverbed. So that's another exciting area. Any of you have expertise on how to excavate uh, shipwrecks from underneath, uh, I don't know, about uh, 10 meters of muck or of mud, uh, let us know, because it's not going to be so easy. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, potential for tourism. Uh, lastly, you mentioned about uh, the plastics industry in Skemtani. This is a real headache. This came about when China decided to 
banned uh, imports of, uh, of used plastics, particularly from the US and Europe. And uh, since then, those shipments of plastic have been coming our way. And those industries in China literally moved. They, they, they shut down the factories, dismantled their machines, and brought them to Skemtani. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think Mestek had some trouble with shiploads of plastics coming from all over the world. Uh, and a lot of them are uh, not cleaned, not, not, not proper plastic, uh, clean plastic waste. In fact, they were just uh, rubbish, you know, um, for a purpose of being processed here. So, obviously, um, uh, many of these plants didn't have the permits, or even if they had, it was not for, uh, for treating plastics, it was for something else. And we've asked Mestec to take uh, uh, action on that. The, the local uh, council ha have al also withdrawn uh, permits. Um, some of them that we find are clean enough, we've asked them to move to Bukit Slambau. We have an area there for this purpose. I think only three or four of them have moved. So they, they are legal. But the, the ones that are still in Skemtani are illegal. We've shut down 16 of them, um, 17, I think. And, uh, and even if some, uh, if, even so, some of them are still operating illegally, and we we are getting reports from the residents, the the, the local YB there. Of course, his his home is right there, so he's really incensed about about this, and he'll report to me, and, and we we take further action. But um, uh, basically, State Exco has decided we just don't want to do anything. We don't want to have anything to do with plastics anymore. Uh, uh, we we really don't need all that stuff. I saw a video about all this rubbish coming from the UK, and uh, we just don't need them. We don't want to be a rubbish dump uh, for for the West, and uh, and but we, we just want the, the good high quality plastics. Siri, I got to ask two follow up questions. Okay, okay. I listen with great fascination what you said about the Pujang Valley. I bet less than 20% of the people here have visited the Pujang Valley. Well, those who have been there, put up your hand. Let's do a test. I think it's less than 20%. <laughs> now, what is the state government doing to promote it? Because given what, what you have told us is something that I think many, many people would like to visit. But of course, there's a question of marketing, there's a, there's a question of presentation in, that needs investment. So the first question is, you see a lot of promotion of Langkawi as the destination for tourism, but what are you doing on Pujang? That's number one. The second thing that I'd like to ask is, you talked about the federal government and state government making some institutional adjustments. Like, for example, the federal government uh, giving more of the revenue to the state and the federal government having less, which means that the state has to do more things and the federal government doing less things. So what would be some of the areas you think that could be a redivision of labor? Like, for example, the obvious one to me would be a bus system. Right now, every bus station, uh, stop in the country is decided in Putrajaya. That is ridiculous. So I'd like to know, besides transportation, what kind of uh, rearrangement? Uh, regarding um, Bujang Valley, we are, I, I think this is not really unique to Kedahans, but uh, we are shy to promote something that we feel is not quite up to mark just yet. You know, we feel that there needs to be some basic infrastructure ready there first before we are brave enough to go and promote it to the rest of the world. But then we need to strike a balance. Where's the point where you start to do it? Yeah? Even as we speak, over a thousand people will visit Bujang Valley every week. A thousand already without any promotions, and um, and these are some of them are uh, students, uh, some are tourists coming in from Penang when they hear about things, despite the lack of promotions. But somehow they they get to know about it. 
So we have been dealing with uh, MOTEC, Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. They have allocated some funds. Uh, we're working also with NCIA to basically uh, develop some basic uh, amenities at the site, uh, Sungai Batu we call it, uh, so that uh, basic stuff will be there like toilets and stuff like that. Of course, that's, that, that is a must. But then uh, a, a small uh, showcase to display some of the artifacts that we have discovered there, uh, a bit of history uh, to get people excited about what they're seeing there. Of course, this is not Borobudur. Uh, this is not Angkor Wat. We don't have a huge uh, uh, monuments and things like that, you know. But but still, uh, from a historical standpoint, it is uh, extremely interesting, I would think. So so we are working with the federal government on on uh, developing before we start to promote. What's the private sector role in this? Oh yeah, we we are very very open. So there there have been one proposal that is a, a PPP. Yeah. So. Of course, private sector doesn't mind if federal one, uh, federal government wants to put in some money, but then um, but, uh, then it go, goes back to the business of it. So, how do we charge a certain entrance fee? Then will the will that be allowed to be given to the private sector developer? Things like that. So, we are willing to to uh, discuss that actually. So, if there are any ideas like that, please please uh, feel free to write to me about that. Um, institutional adjustments. Uh, which areas? <clears throat> there, one of the things, well, related to transport, for example, yeah, we have Langkawi that is already doing okay. I mean, it, I don't, I wouldn't say that it's doing extremely well, but it's 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 reached a certain ceiling right now. We have to kind of push Langkawi further. Um, it's only stuck at about three to three and a half million tourists a, a year. And uh, we need to do more to attract more people in. But it's, again, logistics. So more airlines coming in. We just got Qatar Airways flying five times a week from Doha. Uh, but the key thing is the ferry terminal. So Kwa is OK. Well, it could be better, but it's all right for the moment. But Kuala Kedah is horrible. I mean, uh, any of you have gone through that, I mean, it's a nightmare. And uh, I think our friendly newspaper style will be writing about it all the time, about <laughs> Kolkata, uh, about how the, about about how uh, it's really a sad, uh, sorry state lah. The the Kolkata uh, ferry terminal. Uh, so, uh, Ministry of Transport uh, has already agreed to basically demolish the old one, build build a totally new one. Or even develop on top of the of the of the old one, uh, basically to increase the capacity, make it more more decent, you know, and uh, and that's something we really need. And state government is just not able to do it. We don't have the funds for it, uh, but we know that it is crucial. It's just too embarrassing to have not only foreign tourists, our own local tourists going to that ferry terminal having to sit on the floor and things like that and don't even get me started about the toilets. And, <laughs> and, uh, and the, 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 this, uh, the system being used there, the problem with it is that absolutely no system, no system about, uh, about uh, embarking, disembarking from, from the ferries. So, um, so the, the the whole experience to Langkawi begins from the journey, right? So if the first impression is bad, then the whole trip is spoiled. So we need to be looking at that, and the federal government is uh, helping us with that. That's just one example, I guess. Um, uh, when it comes to the airport, the federal government is uh, um, uh, not putting in money at the airport, but then slam, yes, the, the, the federal government uh, is uh, doing that as a project. Uh, so, it is this kind of catalytic type of uh, development that is going to help boost the economy for the state and hopefully our people will benefit from it. Yes, the most important thing when we talk about all these things, you know, why are we doing this? It has to be for the people. There's really no point uh, having all these projects and then it's uh, basically for uh, foreign workers to fill in those vacancies. You know, we have to make sure that our own people are 
have the academic uh, qualification, the know-how, the skills to fill the future job opportunities that we're going to open up. And uh, if not, basically we're missing the point. So I keep t um, saying this when I meet university students, uh, whether in Kedah or outside Kedah. Uh, this is the, these are our plans. This is going to happen in the next three to four years. Please be prepared. So uh, if you're taking something else other than what we plan to do, then we may not have uh, a job to offer you. But then if you're taking logistics, if you're taking aerospace engineering, if you, or you're doing mathematics and things like that, all relevant to us, then um, we want to make sure that there is a job waiting for you when, by the time you graduate. So this is extremely important because investors ask us this. Where are the... Uh, where's the uh, uh, the human capital coming from? Uh, so, so we have to convince them that oh, we have them. You know, uh, all our universities are geared. Uh, we have enough people. Uh, our vocational institutions are already uh, to basically take on the jobs that you're going to create um, as soon as you invest there. So, that's a very key thing, and I think federal government helps there uh, as well. Uh, YAB is a very impressive speech uh, that you have given and also sharing the great progress that Kedah has been made. I would like to ask uh, some questions that is slightly of a different angle. I would like to hear your opinion and also relating to your personal experience. What is the most significant difference being a PNMB and a PHMB? And also the other thing is as a key leader of a, of a Malay-based party, how do you see the fear that there are so many parties competing to represent the Malay interests and how this may or may not turn in turn weakens the Malays collectively in relation to non-Malays. And finally, do you agree that all Malay-based parties should merge into one or come under one coalition? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, salam sejahtera. So um, you have a very interesting situation in Dun Kedah, in a sense that you have 19 seats, right, made up uh, of uh, four parties, and the opposition is uh, 17 seats, made up of two from AMNO, and 15 from PAS, Party Islam Malaysia. But at the same time, uh, we don't hear much of uh, fireworks and uh, sparks coming out from Dun Keda every time they see it. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, your, your success in dealing with them. Uh, maybe uh, they are not out just to oppose you for the sake of opposing. Maybe they are falling in line with what they propose as their budaya politik matang dan sejahtera. And they will support you as long as you have policies which will benefit the right, yeah, like you have said so yourself. And finally, I'm just wondering, is this success in dealing with a strong opposition in Kedah a contributory factor in past pledging 18 MPs solid support for your father to continue as Prime Minister until full term? Thank you. Yang Ahmad, Muhammad, uh... Your presentation on KEDA was impressive. And I hope other states follow your example of growth. But this question of shared prosperity, how do you see it? Is it the same or going to be the same as a new economic policy? Or is it different? And if different, how? If I may ask a follow-up question. Growth is important, but I think as you said, made the good point, you can't move without good human resources. And the field of education, which you are now being associated with, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> but this is speculation, sir. And in any case, as somebody on the ground who is leading the way with the importance of uh, foreign investment 
and the relationship with human resources. What do you think should be the changes in the present education policy to enable us to move forward at a faster pace? Thank you. It seems like the, the later into the session we go into the, the more chapu mas, the questions are. <laughs> so, um, at the first part, um, the difference between a BNMB and a PHMB, <laughs> I, I think it's the same, still the same MB, but, um, but I, I do find there are certain differences, yes. Uh, I, someone asked me about this before, and I, I was thinking about that because it's not uh, your typical question. Is that um, when I was a, a BNMB, uh, I think there was a certain set of SOPs that an MB follows, and it, it normally came from the top leadership, of course, uh, at the federal government. Uh, but now we are. I, I wouldn't say we are free, um, left to our own devices, but then we are given enough leeway to uh, negotiate or to talk to the federal government uh, to change how things are done or to give new perspectives so that decisions are a bit more, uh, more meaningful for stakeholders at the state level. And it's very fortunate that the federal government also very willing to listen to this. Uh, I think I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't get very far if I, I brought these matters up uh, when I was uh, a BNMB, uh, because that was how things were done for 60 years, for example. You know, I mean, that, that's the, 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 <laughs> the excuse that'll be used all the time. And, and, and I find it really exasperating that I, I, can't, I can't get things to change. So now I find it not only easier, there, there seems to be the political will to listen to what the states uh, want to do. And it's really tight, I'm jumping a little bit, but it's really tied to this whole uh, shared prosperity thing. It's the, uh, it gives us, uh, it's an, uh, an open door to listen more to what really the states want. Because sometimes, uh, I wouldn't say that we know better, but because we are on the ground, so we know how things are, and uh, and how to to uh, to be more effective in governing. And at the same time, the clincher is we can tell the federal government you get to even save money. <laughs> you know, because the last time I have to admit, uh, I mean, monies were spent. You know, like like there was like like uh, uh, there was an endless supply of it. You know. Uh, so, so now we we are very prudent. We we are very uh, we are stickler for governance. Um, for example, uh, I I announced uh, that I'm uh, happy with the offer from MECC to actually uh, assign a senior officer uh, in my office uh, to basically advise us, make sure that what we're doing is above board at all times. Uh, Sabah has done it already, so uh, Kedah. Uh, would be the second one, um, but uh, this would have been unthinkable during the BN government before. So, um, and then um, about Malay interests, merge of parties, I'm going to connect that with the, the question that was asked after that also about how we manage the opposition. Well, uh, when Basatu was first uh, formed, we did have as our own mission, uh, although it was not written, uh, to be a, a serious alternative to AMNO, uh, to allow for those who who were in AMNO to consider Basatu as as a natural uh, place they would migrate to, you know. Uh, we are only partly successful, not, not all. And uh, there are for various reasons, uh, I think many of you already would know. But um, uh, it's a work in progress. It, it, is, it looks like uh, in, in Malaysia, I mean, some, many perhaps may not agree with me on this, but it seems that 
uh, political parties are still race-based somewhat, somewhat, you know, particularly with uh, with how uh, AMNO and PAS has been run, one uh, as a more ethnic group and the other one uh, uh, religious. But, um, but there seem to be a need for that. So we are only trying to meet that need. You know? So whether we're going to be able to merge, and whether we want it, uh, it's, it's another matter altogether. I, I mean, for now, it is somewhat uh, unfortunate uh, that the uh, Malay electorate is split many ways uh, between the, the various parties. Um, so, uh, so some have talked about mergers, but the thing about it is I cannot myself imagine merging with AMNO where we came from. Uh, many of us literally left Amno. In my case, and in the case of Tansi Muhyiddin, we were expelled from the party. Uh, Ton left on his own volition m much early on. Uh, so uh, I don't think there is any question of us going back there. You know, so uh, it's already in the past for us. We we've moved on, uh, but um, but. Uh, we are actually open to receiving some of them joining us. Sabah, for example, uh, Amno Sabah basically uh, disintegrated uh, because over 21 of their divisions literally moved to Besatu. Uh, and um, so the Amno in Sabah right now is a new Amno, it's not, not the old one, except for a few leaders there. Lah. So, um, about Kedah, uh, one way is, I mean, who wants to fight a friendly face like this? You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't think we want to. <laughs> uh, we, we quarrel in the state assembly, but we, we smile. So Kedah, we have our own ways. You know, it was such a relief for me because I had one term as, a, as an MP. Uh, and then uh, Topa, my boss in Miti, uh, was traveling a lot, uh, and then the other deputy minister of Miti was from Sarawak, and because uh, Sarawak had a state election, so he was based there a lot. So I ended up being in parliament a lot, uh, representing Miti. And uh, I must say, I didn't really enjoy that, okay? <laughs> because, <laughs> because you know how parliament is, it gets a bit rowdy, and then uh, 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 the August, so-called, uh, August hall, not so August, actually, the kind of language they use. And uh, so it was really stressful. I think I lost most of my hair when I was an MP. <laughs> Luckily. Cooling it up. <laughs> so I tell people uh, in, in, in Malay, we say, uh, Target gambut dalam tepuk, you know. <laughs> uh, the literal translation is pull hair from the from flour, you know. So you don't want the hair to split, and you don't want the flour to. How do you explain this in English? <laughs> so it probably doesn't make any sense in English, but in Malay, we, we, in Malay, we understand it totally. So I think uh, a lot of tare gambot um, causes all this, you know. <laughs> so, so I've literally lost a lot of that because of, of diplomacy. So when I moved to Kedah, the, the first time I contested uh, in a state uh, seat in Kedah, I, I convinced my bosses that I didn't want a, a parliamentary seat. I want to be fully uh, uh, in the state. They didn't believe me at first, but then I, I said that no, I just want to contest. Not only did I, didn't I want to stand in a parliament seat, I chose a seat that we lost before, which is uh, Aitam. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, I won that seat, and fortunately also we took the state government back from pass, and then I became MB. Uh, but the moment I stepped into the state assembly, I found that it's so mild. I mean, you know, the arguments, uh, you know, they, they, it's like silat, you know, it's like wayang kulit, you know. <laughs> so, so they, they, um, there, there is some parry and all that, but then it's, it's like uh, uh, they, they don't really go for the juggler. You know? So I, I found that so, uh, was such a relief. Uh, so because of that, the banter was somewhat friendly. I mean, and then um, uh, I knew the chief uh, opposition, 
uh, from past. Uh, he was also an alumni of mine from Ansara. We were all ex MRSM students. So of course, he was from Sremban and from Kota Baru. Um, and so we weren't really going after each other. So, so uh, we found that a lot of things uh, got done because of that, you know. And uh, of course, you might know uh, the guy who, who I was uh, facing in the state assembly, who was the chief of the opposition, eventually joined Besatu. He's now the deputy finance minister, <laughs> Dr. Amiruddin. Uh, so he's, he's one of us now. So uh, I guess it was that rapport that we have that, that made, uh, it was personal uh, relationships. And then I had one stint as opposition in the state. Yeah? When I was expelled uh, from the party, from AMNO, I moved to the other side. So um, I was not uh, opposition chief, but um, I was given some uh, some leeway to have extra time to speak and all that. Uh, I, uh, and I got to know a lot of the opposition uh, leaders at the time. Uh, and then when we worked together and won the state, so many of them became uh, came to our side, and I appointed them uh, our ex course, including from DAP, from Amana, from PKR, so except PAS which was unfortunate, I thought, at that time, but they decided to stay on the other side. So whether that contributed towards 18 mem uh, past mem MPs uh, supporting uh, Tone as PM, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, but we know them. I mean, uh, uh, I, I find that uh, we don't really quarrel with them so much. I mean, we have our differences. Some of our differences are very very substantial, but then uh, we, 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 we're not at each other's throats. And then, um, uh, Tansi, your, your point, I, I've read many of your articles about this issue, but I wouldn't say it's an issue, but the shared prosperity is, you know, um, um, right from the early days of the NEP, it was always uh, growth with equity. It was not growth at all cost. Um, the trickle-down effect didn't work. We needed to guide uh, growth so that it, ma it, it meant something to those who mattered. It's usually the, the, the ones who were, were uh, uh, disenfranchised, right? So uh, if we're not looking at the individuals, now we're looking at the state level. Uh, there are obviously some states that have been slow in 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 growth and in my in my case in the Kedah, it's not to say our fault but because we were so um, committed towards this food security but it was unfortunate that uh, paddy or rice uh, uh, cultivation is not one that enriches the state so we are heavily dependent on subsidies as i mentioned just now so so we are now, we, it's not a demand, but then we, we, we feel that we are entitled because we sacrifice so much. We also, uh, we also preserve our forest because of this. So we think that the federal government should give more attention to the poorer states. And when shared prosperity was announced as a new vision, we wholeheartedly supported it because we thought that it was timely. So now at the state level, we too have to implement shared prosperity because we have certain districts like Baling, Sek, uh, Yan, uh, Padang Terap that are behind. They are nowhere near Sungai Petani or uh, and Kuala Muda, uh, even Kota Star. Yeah. So, so, and of course Langkawi, Kuban Pasu, they are, they are a bit more advanced. So we, we need to, to, I wouldn't say discriminate, but then we, we need to pay uh, more attention to those the districts that are behind. So maybe they want to do something like uh, agriculture, uh, agro industries and things like that, tourism. Um, but um, but we, we think that uh, growth with, with equity at the state district level also uh, is a, a policy that is worthwhile uh, taking on. And you, you're correct. Uh, I also uh, w um, truly believe that we have to focus on education. Uh, I think half, if not more, of all our problems can be solved if our people are correctly educated 
and and uh, I, I I think uh, uh, Dr. Masli, when he was the education minister, I think he was working really hard on that, trying to uh, disrupt. You know, I mean, he was into into disruption. Um, it worked sometimes, sometimes it didn't, but it's okay. I mean, it's a work in progress. And then now uh, PM himself has taken on the responsibility. And um, at the state level, uh, Kedah aspires to be the top five in education. We are number 11 at the moment, you know, so we are way down there. So when this idea was first mooted uh, five years ago, I asked the education department in Kedah, what is it that you're doing that's different that's going to bring you up to the, to the top five? If you're doing exactly the same thing, it's basically, you know, um, uh, basically repeating past mistakes, you're not going to get anywhere. So we were looking at disruptive uh, uh, um, methods and technology and using technology and things like that to try and help uh, students in Kedah to do better than their counterparts. Trangano, for example, fantastic work they do there, you know, I mean, uh, but of course they have the money, they, they, I mean, they, 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 but they spend the money wisely. Uh, we, we are getting some help from federal, I, I hope to allocate some of those funds from the federal government uh, for education. And um, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm uh, capable to suggest ideas about how actually do we improve our education system. I think this, this is a big subject. Uh, um, the acting uh, minister will do it. Uh, the, acting, uh, the acting minister will do it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, so um, uh, I think he's, he's actually quite passionate about that. You may recall that he actually was eyeing that that portfolio even from before. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know whether he was willing to relinquish the PM ship just for that, but <laughs> but uh, but um, but at the at the time, I mean, it was thought that because because in our manifesto we had already said that the prime minister should not uh, hold two portfolios. But actually, at that time, it was meant what was meant was the finance ministry. Yeah. So that practice, I think, needed to stop, and we did that. I mean, we split between the PM and the FM. Uh, I mean, finance, not foreign, but uh, but um, education is a different ball game altogether. I think education needs special attention. If we get education right, I think we solve m more than half of our problems already. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Dato. Uh, saya Alia Shahid Alias. Um, I'm born and raised in Kulim. Oh. Uh, I'm very proud being Kulim, and I'm very actually. I'm thank you so much for being our MB from last time and right now, <laughs> and we are happy for Kulim Airport. Uh, but today I would love to talk about the ecotourism, um, especially in Langkawi. We we used to have uh, it before, and it's very um, okay. But um, the thing is, uh, because of the ecotourism. We, we understand all the tourists came and it give a lot of economic, good economic uh, turnout to all the ragyat. But uh, the thing is, um, I think Fed, no, sorry, state don't really educate well uh, them, the ragyat, how to really take care of the environment. Because actually right now uh, in Langkawi, we already had a problem with the helang. We already have problem with the haki sun and everything because of the boats, because of the food that they're giving to the helang. So I think uh, it's still for, for, for the ecotourism, yes, we love that, but we still have to educate the, the, the rakyat. And especially for the Sungai Batu. Uh, the Sungai Batu need a good Paga, the all the, because actually uh, I am from there. I passed that. Okay, so um, the question is, how you want to educate um, our people to 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 achieve the ecotourism to be at that level? Because now you're talking about ecotourism in Lembah Kelang, uh, sorry, Lembah Bujang. We're talking about uh, Sungai Sungai Tua and also Langkawi and also Jerai. Uh, second the distribution of economic. Uh, we understand Kulim is very high tech, we have high tech, we have everything, we have a good school there. But how about Yan, Pendang and everything that there's a lot of old folks staying there because there's no young people, because young people keep on going, uh, going out from Kedah. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs>
Dr. Sri Mukris, good to hear from you again. Thank you for sharing the developments in Kedah, specifically also for the Kulim International Airport. Uh, for many years we've been hearing about this airport and good to hear that now under your leadership there's finally some substantial progress, both on the airport. Yes, <laughs> not a flying car, I hope. <laughs> Um, for, for the airport as well as for um, for related uh, industries. Very uh, short and practical question. When should the uh, airport be operational? Thank you. Um, just a quick question uh, regarding income tax. Um, why is it, as you said, there are some laws that are 60 years old in this country and income tax still goes to the federal government but it's not redistributed to state governments. Is this something which uh, you and your fellow chief ministers and metribasas can speak to the finance ministry. Thank you. First of all, uh, yes, when, when we talk about ecotourism, one of the major challenges we are faced with is how do we educate our own people to understand what that is about and how they contribute, but how they benefit also. So Langkawi is called a geopark. Um, why? Because the Gunung Machinchang is 550 million years old. It is the oldest. It's the same uh, mountain range as Gunung Jerai. That's why Jerai is also a geopark, but a uh, state geopark, national geopark. Uh, whereas the uh, Langkawi Geopark is um, uh, UNESCO. 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 Yeah. So um, uh, it's slow in progress. I, I must admit. Uh, it was fortunate that when the Geopark guys came for our re-evaluation, I think it's every four years or so, uh, they interview people randomly, you know, and ask them whether they know anything about the Geopark. So fortunately, the Machi that they asked at the time <laughs> knew. <laughs> uh, I think she must have been briefed before, or she had seen, uh, read a, a brochure, or she attended one of the talks about the Geopark, and, and she was a, a Trader, I think she was not selling nasi lemak, but then she said that she benefited from that, and and she also promotes the Joe Park when she gets the chance to meet with uh, tourists. But then there are certain practices there uh, that are not conducive towards ecotourism. And you correctly pointed out one of the things that our boatmen will do when they go into Sungai Kilim to impress the tourists is they they rev up the the motto of the boat, yeah and the eagles get attracted by the noise and they come swooping down and then these guys will throw chicken you know onto the water and the, i mean not many places in the world you get to see feeding eagles you know uh, but it is not natural that's that's the problem with it you know so uh, first it's not natural for eagles to be eating eating um, chicken like that. <laughs> frozen. <laughs> no, not frozen, but then <laughs> it's not ayamas or anything like that. But uh, but um, but still, it's not natural. It's not the uh, and uh, it is their habitat. So Kilim is their habitat. But then uh, to get attracted to revving motorboats and things like that is a bit uh, uh, not natural. So we try to educate our guys to to understand what a geopark really means. The other thing is that in pursuit of, of revenue, yeah, to take on tourists. So they want to go in and out quickly. Yeah. So they speed, you know. So when they, we tell them to slow down, Sungai uh, Kilim, because it's a Joe Park, you have to slow down, it's a mangrove area. When they speed, the, the waves start to erode the, the embankment of the river. Yeah. So then uh, the, our own livelihood, the, the mangrove will slowly be, be eroded. So we explain these things. Uh, some of them understand. Some of them, uh, they just want to make their daily uh, buck. You know. So I think it's work in progress, uh, unfortunately. But um, uh, we're trying to show them that eventually they benefit from abiding by this set of rules that we, we have. Uh, because tourists come because we are a Joe Park. So if you don't do this, eventually your own livelihood will be impacted by that. So that's one thing. Um, and then, um, uh, yes, we hope to get a budget from Motec uh, to build fence around Singapore Batu, uh, because if not, we have uh, people encroaching. Um, and then uh, I, I mentioned earlier about how we're going to uh, focus on those areas that have been left behind. So Yan included, Parantara, Nibaling, Se. Yeah. 
Um, um, so, uh, say for example, we have organic rice being grown there, and it's now becoming an attraction for tourists. People come to actually till the rice fields uh, in in their can play card in their sarongs, you know. Uh, it's nice to see a blue-eyed, blonde European <laughs> wearing a hat and a uh, some uh, company can play card, <laughs> walking into into the paddy field uh, to plant paddy. Uh, although locals don't do that anymore, but <laughs> we now use machines. But then, but it's okay. I mean, they they like that, and um, the occasional leech doesn't turn them off. But um, uh, but uh, but I, I think the activities like that that I, I, can can spur growth in these areas. And the NCIA actually is doing a lot of work there. We we have specific budget by NCIA to look at at least Yan Sik and. Baling uh, and Baling. So we have those projects going on now, and CIA is uh, uh, the custodian for those projects. Uh, KXP, we are already appointing the master plan um, uh, and then the detailed feasibility study. Uh, we hope to have it operational by 2024. So, uh, income tax. <laughs> when, when I was still. Uh, BNMB, who's the gentleman who asked this? All right there, right. So, uh, when I was still a BNMB, uh, in the State Assembly, uh, I had asked on behalf of the State Government that at that time the, the GST be brought down to 3%, yeah, instead of 6 And uh, I noticed that my colleagues sitting on my side were not thumping the table. Instead, the opposition was like really hard. <laughs> and I knew then there was a sign that I wasn't going to last long as an MB. <laughs> and sure enough, three months later, <laughs> I was yesterday's news. And, um, uh, but the point I was making was that I think in Australia, the different uh, states, or they call province or um, provinces, provinces in, in Australia, states, uh, states, right? states, yeah, sorry, states, sorry, <laughs> they, are, they, they can negotiate with the federal government for um, a portion of the the GST that's collected, you know, uh, depending on the level of development that uh, they have, so. That was one of the ideas uh, I, I suggested as well, that perhaps it was, uh, it, because if you go by only the amount that's collected at that particular state, I mean, Kedah, I mean, what are we contributing? I mean, it has to be uh, uh, put uh, as a collective, um, sorry, Wang um, di Satu the uh, consolidated accounts. Uh, and then redistributed, redistributed. Right now, that's already happening by way of projects, but not by way of uh, funds. Yeah? So then it's up to us to go and um, walk up and down ministries asking for projects, specific projects for the state. Every state does that. I tell my guys that, hey, look, you know, I'm, Ministry of Finance, how many Kedahans are working there? Actually, there are quite many. Uh, I think I think they are, they are number one in Kelantan is second with Kedah, I think. So, so I mean, if you have uh, uh, relatives or friends that you know in the finance ministry, why don't you go and talk to them and see whether they can bring in some some of the projects to Kedah? And and they are very open about it. They 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 are quite happy to do that. You know, uh, I mean, the ministries are very happy to. To listen to to our proposals, and I think that's the way for the moment. But um, uh, if the federal government could consider giving tax co uh, collection directly to the states, uh, we'd be very happy to receive also. So or to the, allow the states to borrow money. Uh, well, for infrastructure oh, projects. Kedah, I, I <laughs> one time it was so embarrassing. Every time. We go into a national finance meeting, uh, chat by the prime minister himself, uh, and then they show that graph that shows all the states that owe federal government money. 
Uh, I have to hide my face because Kada is like so high up there. <laughs> you know, we are we are the ones with the most because of uh, water infrastructure. Yeah. So it was like 2.6 billion ringgit. It's that number again, 2.6 billion. <laughs> but then, uh, <laughs> I'm not. I don't know why that number recurs all the time. But <laughs> but uh, but that was what Kada owed. Uh, and um, so. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard about this thing called PAAP. Uh, what does that stand for now? PAAP. Uh, it's a water board under 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 cats. Eh? Uh, so we are at the final uh, negotiations with cats uh, for cats to take uh, over uh, a large chunk of our water debt, uh, and then uh, we'll service the remainder. So so. Your point just now is that if we can reduce that, that also helps in uh, in our revenues. Thank you very much, uh, Tato Siri. It's uh, seven o'clock, so I'm afraid we have to call it a day. I we thank you all. We thank you for your insightful observations on the need for a change in the state-federal relationship, and I especially appreciate your frank assessment on the state of competition among the Malay parties. So I think let us thank our speaker for the wonderful. <laughs> and I think uh, we would like to present you a memento for your contribution. Could I invite Tan Siri Jeffrey Chia on stage? <laughs> Thank you all for coming and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.